They are living fossils. Horseshoe crabs are curiously resilient and unassuming creatures whose unique biology has captivated the interest of man for decades. More closely related to spiders and scorpions than to true crabs, ancestors of horseshoe crabs existed 350 million years ago, long before the age of dinosaurs. In the 1900s, horseshoe crabs were commonly used in the farming industry as crop fertilizers and as feed for livestock. By the mid-1970s, commercial fishermen began using them as bait for eel and conch fisheries. But it's the crab's blue blood that revolutionized the medical industry. They have a special uh, chemical in their blood that's used to detect the presence of bacteria. And that bacteria and assay is used to screen everything that goes into a human being and to test the sterility of all the machines that are used to deliver such products like IV fluids. And that's not the only factor that makes horseshoe crabs of interest to modern science. Dr. Barbara Battelle from the University of Florida's Whitney Lab for Marine Bioscience in Marineland focuses on the animal's distinct visual system. Well, it has 10 eyes, two compound eyes that are just like fly eyes. These are the big eyes that you see on the sides of the, of the carapace, or the upper part of the animal. And the photoreceptors are very large, among the largest in nature. So in experimental preparation, they're really very useful. Horseshoe crabs have roughly a thousand photoreceptors or light-sensitive cells in each compound eye, compared to the millions found in human eyes. There are many people that have reduced vision and we don't have an explanation for it. Why is vision going down? How does that happen? Well, in mammals, it's difficult to study because our eyes are complex. In 1976, Researchers from Syracuse University discovered that manipulation of an optic nerve that transmits signals from the brain to the compound eyes of a horseshoe crab mimics the visual function of circadian clocks. Circadian clocks are internal clocks that we have in our cells and in our brain that make us change our physiology day to night and we experience the effects of our circadian clocks when we travel across time zones. The circadian clock in your brain doesn't only control your sleep-wake cycle, it also controls how our eyes work. In 1967, Dr. Halden Keffer Hartline and his colleagues at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, won the Nobel Prize for their work examining horseshoe crabs. They identified lateral inhibition, a visual process in animals and humans alike, that enhances contrast, helping the eye to see borders and edges. Scientists at the Whitney Lab hope this species will provide even more clues on the basic mechanisms of vision. Oftentimes, our circadian rhythms de you know, degrade as, as we age. And it could be that some of the reasons for impaired vision as we get older is that the signals from the circadian clock are degrading and the cells aren't getting the information they should get. To test this theory, Dr. Battelle works with live specimens from her wet lab, where a skylight provides natural day and nighttime light patterns. Tissue samples from the compound eye are analyzed to detect any biochemical changes that occur in response to internal or external stimuli. We discovered a major protein in the photoreceptor. So a protein is the part of the cell that actually does the work of the cell. And so we found a major protein that is changed in response to the signal from the central 24-hour clock. And we don't really know what that protein does yet, but we think it has a major impact on the way the photoreceptor cells function. By controlling circadian input to the compound eye, lab tests revealed concentrations of the newly discovered protein Opsin-5. Although similar proteins are far more abundant during the night and day, 
Opsin-5 molecules may still impact photoresponse. So we can see these, you know, these proteins actually move around. They're in different places depending on the time of day. And it gives us some clue about how the photoreceptor is changing its sensitivity day to night, clock input, no clock input, and so forth. So it gives us a clue of what's going on inside the cell. Studies indicate that light, as well as the animal's circadian clock, regulate Opsin-5 differently than other photosensitive proteins. Experts suspect that changes in levels may underlie some of the dramatic day-night changes in photoreceptors. The horseshoe crab and its eyes become about a million times more sensitive at night than they are during the day. And what's really interesting is that we found the same kind of protein in the photoreceptors of mammals. And that's the way the sort of comparative biology that we do works. So we find something in a simpler organism, and then we ask, well, are we finding the same sorts of things in other organisms? Basic mechanisms that go on in cells, regardless of species, are similar. And as we discover what this protein does in the horseshoe crab eye, then we can begin to ask more pointed questions about what it might be doing in our own eyes. So if we can figure out how to make cells more sensitive to light, then the potential is that we can fix them. Marine invertebrates are seemingly basic organisms. Yet their simplistic anatomies offer great insights into the way the human nervous system functions. The larvae of starfish help researchers understand how the body defends itself against disease. The mechanisms by which nerve impulses travel along nerve fibers was discovered via studies on squid. In 2000, experiments with sea slugs won Eric Kandel and his colleagues at Columbia University the Nobel Prize in Medicine for their work on the cellular processes of learning and memory. The National Resource for Aplesia in Miami is the only facility in the world where sea slugs are raised for research purposes. Aplesia californica has become an important model for studying the development of the nervous system, learning, behavior. In 1975, Thomas Capo joined Eric Kandel at Columbia University where he worked to improve the availability of sea slugs or aplesia for year-round studies. Aplesia are an annual animal. If you want to work with small animals in the late summer, you can't find them. Or if you wanted to work with small animals in the winter, they're not available. So what we do here at the University of Miami's uh, Pleasure Resources, we raise animals throughout the year. Before coming to Miami, researchers moved to Woods Hole, Massachusetts, where original aquacultural operations began on Aplesia californica, a species commonly found on the west coast of the United States. By 1978, we had moved to Woods Hole, and it's there that we made the major breakthroughs in getting large numbers of animals through the larval phase and metamorphic phases. And once we were able to grow large numbers of animals, it became obvious that we needed a larger facility, a better facility, and there was a major problem working in Woods Hole, and that was food supply. And in Florida, at the University of Miami's experimental facility on Virginia Beach was the ideal place because not only did we have an abundant supply of ambient seawater, we also had warm weather to culture the algae. And within two or three years of moving here in 1989, we were able to culture over 300, 400 pounds of seaweed a week, which was necessary to produce the animals. And also, we had an abundant supply of raw seawater, which we could clean up, chill down, and grow our animals in. The facility was initially set up to produce around 10,000 animals, but we've expanded several times over the years, and now we produce anywhere between 25 and 30,000 animals a year for researchers around the world.
One of those researchers, Dr. Leonid Morose, works at the University of Florida's Whitney Lab. His studies focus on how individual nerve cells function in relation to memory and learning. Aplysia offers this opportunity because it has relatively simple neural system, which are only about 100 cells per ganglion and uh, roughly 10,000 cells in the whole brain. And importantly, most of these neurons are giant. So you can see the connections of these cells, and most importantly, you can link everything to be hero. Aplysia neurons are so large, they can be seen by the naked eye. They possess nine groups of nerve cells, or ganglia, within their bodies. Distinct physical features that help experimental scientists view Aplysia as a model organism for neuroscience research. Aplysia seemed to be a interesting approach, a reductionist approach, where, whereby you look at an animal with a small number of neurons and basically get an understanding of how the nervous system works. If you remember your first kiss, more likely what would happen in your brain or happened in your brain that cell A and cell B and cell C, they just talk to each other and the synapses or connections between cells become stronger and more likely they change shape. So efficiency of these connections become better or less better. So if it's better, you more likely will remember something. If it's weaker, you will lose this memory. Dr. Morose examines how aplysia neurons and synapses change as a result of memory formations. Similar to Pavlov's famous salivating dogs experiment, Dr. Morose can elicit specific behaviors from sea slugs through basic forms of learning. You give to aplysia a simpler task. You produce tactical stimulation which associates with some kind of algae or juice, and aplysia will produce feeding reactions following this weak stimuli which normally do not produce. So you do like four repetitions, and aplysia will remember. So this is a sort of elementary form of learning uh, and memory. It's called associative type of memory. When animals associate to type of the stimulus, makes connections, and uh, basically preserves these connections for quite a while. You count number of synapses between cells uh, before and after memory formations. So in all the aplysia, this number of connections become weaker. And similar process happens in human brain or a variety of neurological diseases. So everything what you learn and remember, it's really linked to how one neuron talks to each other and how they preserve this efficiency of these communications. So you can reduce complex memory process to level of only few cells. In fact, many people would be surprised how many neurons would need to form elementary forms of memory. Only three cells is sufficient. By studying learning and memory at the cellular level, Dr. Moreau's hopes his experiments will one day lead to solutions for neurodegenerative conditions, such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's diseases. I bet if you've solved our problem, how in aplysia two neurons talk to each other, how they modify the synapses, it would be one or another ways to apply to clinical studies or disease analysis. Scientists say it is important to study a diverse group of species to better understand complicated processes. If everybody looked just at a rat or a mouse, we'd know a lot about a rat or a mouse, but we wouldn't have the full spectrum of understanding about biology. But by studying these simpler or less complex organisms, we can learn a lot about basic processes, and I think that remains critical to our understanding of our own biology. We knew more about maybe rocks on the moon than what lives in the ocean. Today's biomedical researchers are diving into the deep blue, hopeful the ocean's rich diversity of marine life will reveal answers to man's greatest health issues. One of the things that's been very clear to us as marine scientists over the last several decades is that there are byproducts that we can extract or get from many of these marine organisms that can really benefit humans. We hold so much wealth for us and we get our health from it. 
we firmly believe there is a cure down at the bottom of the sea. Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources.